in the beginning, after we were diagnosed, I couldn't go anywhere without looking at anyone on the street corner, in a car, and not be envious. It was such a powerful emotion f for me. But in time, I came to see that you have to look at what you have, not what you don't have. And you have to make the best of what your life is. It was 1985 when Elizabeth Glazer's daughter, Arielle, was taken to the doctor with stomach aches and cramps. It would be a year before the experts brought the inconceivable news. It was AIDS. Elizabeth Glazer was carrying HIV. Her son, Jake, was positive, too. Only her husband, actor-director Paul Michael Glazer, was not infected. It was a time of panic about AIDS, and Glazer turned to the two people she knew she could trust. She started to tell me, and we both started to cry. And I remember just pulling over to the side of the road and us both just crying and hugging each other. I remember vividly, it was a Sunday morning, she said, I have to tell you the most terrible story that you'll ever hear, and it's a huge burden I'm going to place on you. Susie Zegan and Susan De Laurentiis, Glazer's friends in the good times and now the bad. In 1988, Ariel died at the age of seven. In those first six, nine months after she died, I could barely function. And I just didn't know if I wanted to go on living or not. How much do you tell those two friends about what you go through day in and day out, your spirits? I would say almost everything. Almost everything. It's like they're a part of my pulse. You know, they're always there. And I don't think I could do it without them. And so these three women decided to transform the heartbreak into hope. Moms and homemakers who once shared a life of carpools and dinner parties, but now work full time in the corridors of power in Washington, in research labs, fundraising with big shots, racing against time. They lost the battle for Arielle Glazer's life. They don't plan to lose again for the some 20,000 American children who are HIV positive, including Arielle's freckle-faced little brother, Jake, age nine. What's it like to be, to have HIV? Well, it's really hard to, like, take care of it, and you have to have, to have a lot of strength to, like, get through it. And it's really hard to not get really frustrated. I definitely wanted to do something that would change the awfulness of the way it felt. Susie Zegan, a doctor's wife who had never worked, started by going to a class in fundraising at UCLA. Susan De Laurentiis, who used to work in retail before her two daughters were born, started reading all the research papers on AIDS. We went to join the team. But then we found out there wasn't a team, and that not only was, there wasn't a team, there wasn't a captain, and we were really the only players on the team. So the three women founded the Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Arielle's drawing became the logo. The first priority was getting the scientists to stop guarding their research. My name is Peter Small. I'm an infectious disease fellow at Stanford University. I'm Alan Ezekiewicz. I'm from Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. I'm Russ Van Dyke. I'm head of pediatric infectious diseases at Tulane School of Medicine. They started by flying the best scientists in the country in for a series of think tanks. They put pediatric AIDS on the map. Are any of the things different from what's been seen in adults? We don't know. We don't know. Your data suggested that it well, doesn't shorten survival. It's now clear pediatric AIDS is different, but why do children have more damage to the central nervous system, growth problems? Why do they respond differently to drugs? The three women urge the doctors towards a miracle, with collaboration, research money, and for the first time, a sense of family. The way this goes, the way this goes is salt, your entire shot of tequila, and then the lime, okay? It's a Saturday night ritual for the doctors at the think tank. I have a toast to Elizabeth, Susan, and Susie, who've changed our lives and whose lives we hope to change as well. Dr. Phil Pizzo of the National Cancer Institute has even been seen leading at Itsy Bitsy Conga Line. 
tequila, and laughter in the face of an awful challenge. Now, that's not to say that I have positive attitude all the time, because I don't. And that's not to say that I don't get scared and all those things. Do you know when it's coming? Can you? I know it when it's there. You? Usually blindsides me, but then, boy, when it's there, it's there. And then I work, I have to work on it. And For hours, days? Days, weeks, depends. Yeah. Not hours, it's more complicated. I can't get through it in a, in a few hours. And there are moments when the sixth graders graduated at Ari's school this year. That was, you know, as painful for me as anything I could have anticipated. Sharing her heartbreak, the mother of a sixth grader, Ariel's best friend, Francesca, Susan De Laurentiis's daughter. Do you ever look at Francesca and, and think about Ari? And Absolutely. So many times, you know, you give your kids that extra hug because you're just so happy that, you're, that they're there and you feel so lucky. So how do you relate to the Ariel Project? How did this begin? Well, this De Laurentiis now works full-time overseeing research projects for the Foundation, like the Ariel Project, a $3 million version of a Manhattan Project. Its goal, to block transmission from mother to child. Transmission occurs 25% of the time. A recent breakthrough at NIH showed that the drug AZT could reduce transmission to 8%. Here, blood samples have been collected for multi-clinic experiments designed to reduce that risk to zero. And these are actually some specimens from the Ariel project. Each of these is individual, or are there? Yeah, oh, each one of these is an individual them. specimen, either some blood cells or cells from somewhere else in the patient. And they're all barcoded and frozen and stored here. All in the name of a child called Ariel. This was Ari in Florida when, we first, when she first got sick. There's another shot of her running in the surf, which uh, we have, which mm -hmm. is uh, uh, a very nice shot also. She was quite a spirit. Mm -hmm. What do you think of those three women? I think it's remarkable what they've done. I really do. I do. <laughs> she paid me to say that. <laughs> Paul Glazer continues his own work in the movies. It was a family decision to keep his work life apart from AIDS. Do you still wonder if he ever wants to go off and be away from thinking How about could? it? I mean, I want to go off. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Of course. I mean, there's a part of both of us, honestly, that would have to say, you know, I want to escape this. Now, I can't escape it because I am infected. Paul can escape it. He's healthy. He's, you know, but he can't leave his family. The extended family, which now includes Susie Zegan, who has quietly raised $22 million, calling in every ally she could think of. And Susan De Laurentiis, who has funded 131 research projects all for their friend Elizabeth Glazer, who because of the foundation has become a force to be reckoned with in Washington. She still takes the subways, determined not to waste one penny earmarked for research. This day, she meets with the Clinton AIDS czar, Christine Gebbe, to prod her to select a new director of research. Because I had heard rumblings that maybe this position wouldn't be appointed until the spring, which is unacceptable on the timeline that I'm on. I hope that I am never rude to anyone, because that is never my intention. But in Washington, they don't work on timelines. At the Pediatric AIDS Foundation, we won't work without a timeline. Because time is the enemy. It's a miracle that eight years after her diagnosis, with virtually no infection-fighting T cells, Glazer battles her periodic sick days and never stops the fight.